Hi, my name is Antonella Di Giulio and uh, I'm a concert pianist and music theorist. Welcome to Web Piano Academy and welcome uh, to this live show, Let's Speak Music. Today we will talk uh, uh, with Brian Stevens about uh, how we sing to change lives and why singing matters. Brian is director of choirs at Nazareth College in upstate New York, where he directs the chamber singers and uh, um, the travel choir. He has also taught classes in applied uh, conducting, uh, choral conducting, choral literature, and choral methods. He's founder and artistic director for the upcoming uh, 2021 debut season of uh, Vox AUs, a regional premier women's chamber choir based in Western New York, focusing on contemporary advanced music uh, uh, written by female composers. So, and it is now my pleasure to welcome on our to our stream um, uh, Brian Stevens. Yeah. Hi. How's everybody Hi. doing? So um, let's talk a little bit about your background first, and then we can go into. Uh, discussing a little bit more uh, why singing matters. Sure. So my background um, is the law is not the normal background. People probably get into choral music and singing. Um, from a young age, I was trained as a pianist, um, which is normal enough, except I made the change to jazz piano in my early teens. And mm -hmm. when I attended undergraduate university, um, it was as a music composition and jazz piano major. So uh, my life at that time was really into film music and uh, symphonic writing. Um, I'm also an oboist. So, you know, it, it, singing wasn't really, or choral singing, for example, really wasn't part of my upbringing. It was more orchestral and um, right. uh, jazz ensemble. So... I had the opportunity to experience choir in my undergraduate and, you know, it was, it creates a really strange feelings because using a, myself as the instrument was just so different at the time, you know, from starting piano at a very young age, you know, right. that was my method of expression. So went through all of that. And, um, when it came time for graduation and what am I going to do next? Um, I started getting into teaching and mm -hmm. tutoring and taking on private students. And um, I always found myself singing the piano parts and didn't realize I was always doing that. And that's how I was learning my music. Right. Um, it just, it was a connection I hadn't made is just something I did and uh, learning jazz piano or classical piano. And so then I would have my students sing and I was like, wow, this is, this is interesting. And so mm -hmm. then I became very focused on music education and cognitive cognition and music teaching. And, you know, a lot of that just goes back to an internalization. Yeah. And so I became fascinated with that and I pursued a career in music education and, um, that because I could play piano, ironically enough, it, you'll be great in choir. It'll be fine. <laughs> And uh, who knows so why? Then, yeah, right. I mean, <laughs> so then I, uh, I was able to sort of be put placed into the choral world um, because I knew I didn't want to be, I didn't want to teach all the different instruments. So I think choir was the natural um, direction, but then I had to learn the voice and uh, it became like Sudoku for me. Um, right. like, wow, there's a whole new world. And so participating in more choral projects and seeing the power of singing as far as developing music cognition mm -hmm. and internalization. And, um, it came through my studies with Ed Gordon, um, yeah. at the university of Buffalo. And he, he sort of, you know, he changed my life, um, thinking about, how we learn to learn music through our bodies and our and singing of course is part of that and how that can affect music making on any other instrument or in any other right. media 
So that created a spark. And then long way around, I ended up pursuing, um, like taking it a step further into conducting. And I sound, wow, you know, I started out expressing myself on the piano as a child, then, you know, oboe and piano, then composition, then, you know, comes full circle to conducting, which for me is a cumulative uh, uh, focus of all of my experiences mm -hmm. um, into really finding that that was the place I felt like I could express the most. And that, of course, is through singing and cr and creating opportunities for singing with other people and then you had the notion of community and those types of things so it's just this really i i call it a voyage right <laughs> yes. into into singing a voyage of my career that went through kind of all aspects of music and here we are Right. So I, I always, uh, I, I don't know, as a pianist, I always have the feeling that uh, I, I envy uh, those who can use the voice to express or can, can, to produce music just because it, it is, sounds more more natural. It, you know, uh, you know, if I play something like, oh, how would you sing that? <laughs> um, and that's, uh, yeah, there's a strong connection there, right? Yeah. And I would add that you know, those of us, you know, being an instrumentalist as well, you, you are singing, you wouldn't be able to play what you play. If you didn't have an internal voice inside you that knew what you wanted to do. Right. Uh, now, everybody has different instruments. And surely, you know, most of the singers I work with are far superior to my abilities. And, you know, that's why we love to listen to them sing. Yeah. <laughs> but, but I think no matter what your instrument is, whether you're a concert oboist or an Irish whistle player or a sitar player, uh, you, I think it's a, it is inside of you. You could sing it in your mm -hmm. capacity. Um, yeah. You you totally understand it. There's there's no way you could perform at that level and not have a voice for it. Right. I, I think I think uh, most of the mistakes that instrumentalists uh, uh, make is that. Uh, we often forget the singing part. Like when, when you forget the singing part, you forget the music uh, because there's no music then without the, that kind of natural way of expressing uh, sounds. Um, it's, I, I mean, I found myself, I was uh, recalling the other day that I found myself when I was a teen uh, practicing with closed eyes. So, you know, bl blinded myself. Uh, and then uh, because I wanted to hear the music and I wanted to be more musical and to sing more with my hands rather than just playing technically, you know, moving the fingers around. Um, that, that's a mistake I think that most instrumentalists uh, always make, that they forget that there should be this musical component rather than just a technical aspect of, you know, uh, uh, pressing certain keys in a certain order, right? Well, yeah, there's, a, I mean, by being an instru instrumentalist of any type, there's a, there's a, I don't want to say a mechanical crutch, but there's, there's, there's definitely a mechanical, uh, it could be a mechanical focus or a mechanical directive. And, mm -hmm. you know, I think we get caught up in that because it does require that. I mean, that's a different set of manipulation. Right. Um, yeah. or, or, you know, body awareness. I mean, it's, it's manipulating something in front of you to do what you needed to do. Like that's a different set of skills. You know, you could have someone with really low motor function, um, somebody suffering from a disability or a developmental mm -hmm. disability, but they can sing mm -hmm. yeah, and they can internalize music. And, but you know, maybe the mechanical Nate, the mechanical needs of the piano, you know, won't be something they can do. Right. Um, that's a great thing about music, right? Is everybody can experience it yeah. and, and, and do it to some capacity. Every, I mean, they can't, I mean, that's what they say about like, if you were to lose your ability to hear, well, you could still be musical. You, you could still experience music, especially if you've heard it before. Right. Or if, or, you know, we have vibrations. Um, I think it was Bobby McFerrin who said in this um, documentary I watched once, uh, where he says, like, our bodies are like a large ear. 
yeah. right? We're made of bones. It's like a, like the ear is made of bones and we all have this resonating frequency. You can feel it if a herd of buffalo run past you, you know, there's right. this feeling. So like, do our bones vi vibrate and process music? How much does that play into what we do? Mm -hmm. You know, it, it's really exciting. Um, and I always tell my students or my singers before every, every concert, um, when someone says that piece of music touched me or moved me, um, they're being literal. You know, we, we make music and it travels across space, right? And once that happens, it's received by, it's received physically by the audience and their brains start processing it. And it's this very intimate act. You're literally touching someone when you, when you speak or communicate or yeah. sing or, you know, do something of higher expression. And that's a really big responsibility, I think, that gets lost. Yeah. Is, yeah. you know, whether we're playing the piano or the violin or singing, um, you, you're connecting with another person. Right. Like physically. Yeah, and, and the music has that, that, that uh, I mean, overall sounds and music have that abstraction that uh, would allow us to communicate in any kind of setting. So, so even though, I mean, in the choir would uh, uh, have uh, something in a language that we don't understand, right? It is still, still, I think that kind of those emotions or those kind of things that we want to communicate with would come across as you know they should because it's uh, it's almost impossible to misunderstand to understand oh well you know i felt so happy and then maybe it was a kind of tragedy there right uh, so uh it, it is uh, it is very very um uh, particular for the music you know for sounds for how we connect sounds that uh, we our communication is so good then brian you disappeared for a moment here <laughs> yeah can you hear me? Yeah, 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 sure. I can't hear you for some reason. Can you hear me again? Yeah. I can't hear you. Um, I don't know why I can't hear you. Okay. I take you out of the stream you just a second. I take you down of the stream just a second. Here. Are you okay now? How about now? Yeah, I hear you. I can't not hear anything from you. Just continue. Um, I apologize. This is strange. <laughs> Keep talking. <laughs> All right. Well, um, Keep talking. Uh, <laughs> I know why this is happening. Um, well, I'll just talk a little bit. The, you know, one of the things that Eric Whitaker says is when we sing, we, um, it allows us to ask, to ask and experience the mysteries of the human condition. And it's something I really agree with. If we use language, for example, um, as to what you were saying, if we sing in Hungarian or we sing in Swedish or we sing in Italian, we are, we get to experience that the, the nuances of the language, how someone speaking that language expresses. And that's quite often, you know, just different. I mean, different in some way than, than an English speaker or, an, or someone in American uh, speaking American English. And, that is, that allows us to connect um, with empathy and compassion and to just understand something different. Mm -hmm. And I think that that's really important. Um, you know, we can then, it also, because we have language, allows us to explore as a group of, whether a solo singer or as in a choir, you know, questions like, what is love? Uh, why are we here? Uh, what is grief and loss? 
and joy. Um, and that's one of the big differences with singing is, is really the, the language. You know, certainly we can experience joy through, you know, music you know, cinematically or orchestrally or, you know, that's why we do it. But text is different. It's another element. Right. And um, so I, I think, you know, that kind of, you know, you don't want to say it ties into the STEM stuff, but it does. You know, it allows us to do some other things. And certainly we see the music theory. Our, right. you know, when you start studying music at any level, you know, it's this, it brings about these, um, how would you say, uh, it, it brings about these connections across disciplines and across um, different, different focuses. So I think that that's uh, one of the great things that it does. Um, Daniel Berenbaum is uh, one of the people who talks about this. Um, and one of the things he says that really stuck with me is one of the things that sticks with me is he says, music has a lifetime. It's, it's played and then it goes away. It's gone. Uh, it's over. He says it's finite, um, but every note has a lifetime of its own. And I think about that when I'm teaching text, right? We're moving from one word to the next. How do we get there? And more importantly, what happens when we stop singing? What's, mm -hmm. the, what's the silence? Because the silence allows us to process what we just heard. And that's processing time and, and pitch and rhythm and text and meaning. And then we assign a meaning to that because we've just received that. I mean, it's just, it's just a really cool thing right. as a whole. Yeah. Are you hearing me now? Do you hear me now? <laughs> I'm sorry, I can't hear anything. You're oh, okay, <laughs> that's fine. Um, um, I'd love to reconnect, but I, I don't know what to do. I, right, I can just but, keep saying a few things if you'd like. Yeah, sure. <laughs> um, so I think. That might, you know, I think what I bring to the table with my students and my choirs and one of the big focuses I have as a mission as a music educator is we sing to change lives. Um, and that goes for each one of us individually, you know, you, you make a you make a choice to make music, whether you're sitting down at the piano or we or we're going to sing and use language and text. Um, we make a decision to come together mm -hmm. and, you know, like one of the things that John Rutter, great choral conductor says is, you know, it's, it's that act of coming together that creates this humanity. And by doing that, we leave all of the cares behind us from the day, whether we're sitting down to practice the piano or coming to a choral rehearsal all everything around us kind of gets lost in that common focus of deciding to pour ourselves and our souls into the music and that lifts other people up say you're in a group i think this is one of the most extraordinary things about an ensemble is it could be somebody's worst day next to you and for this few moments this hour and a half we're lifting them up they're they're right there with us um, and it's this, you know, in, in unity, in a single purpose, uh, it could be, you could be from v differing beliefs or ideologies or religions. And for that moment, you are united in common bond, you know, and this is something that, you know, maybe has, maybe has a bigger connection than we're thinking, you know, or something we all need today or our leaders and our you know, music administrators and those people who fund the arts need to think about um, that there is this this kind of human um, condition of it all. And it transcends that. Uh, one of the most profound experiences I had that was the idea of changing lives, I think you mentioned it a little earlier, was uh, 
um, when I was studying in Italy, I was 19 years old. I was in Siena. I went into a music store and uh, I started playing this keyboard in the music store. And I was just, you know, improvising a little bit on some jazz stuff. And then behind me, there was an older Italian man who started playing at another piano. And then we ended up playing and improvising together. And at the time, like, I had no idea what he was saying, or I would not <laughs> understand, but we had probably a 35 minute um, exchange. And then he like grabbed my arm and took me over for coffee. And, you know, I still didn't understand what he was saying, but you know, that's what it's about. Right. It's exciting. Yeah. yeah. And uh, it, it really unites us. Um, and I think that that's really kind of at the heart of it. So as a director, when I'm working with students or an ensemble, I try to give them opportunities that will change their lives. Now, whether that's repertoire, mm -hmm. you know, different languages, uh, living composers, um, repertoire that has, that maybe will, will challenge them in, um, with text or an idea. Um, certainly we're seeing more repertoire that has to deal with difficult questions come out. You know, mm -hmm. we live, we live in that right. time where composers are writing things that are, that have an edge writing things that have something to say um, socially or politically. Um, and, you know, it's an interesting way to explore some of those, those things. I think of, um, there's uh, Melissa Dunphy wrote this really, she's a Australian American composer who lives in Philadelphia. She wrote this really fantastic piece. That's like, that's uh, the text is from the, um, the de declaration of immigration. When you become a U.S. citizen, mm -hmm. you have to read yeah. that, um, that treatise or that that text and she actually sets sets it to music <laughs> and you know i think of the point where there's one part of it where it speaks about uh taking up arms right. for your nation for your new nation or something like that and she sets that very pointedly and you know how exciting a piece would that be to do with some with an ensemble and to get them thinking about other things or how to, you know, what is that process like? Because we can see that it's just some text, but when you sing it, you know, maybe that gets them thinking about people who have had to gone through, go through that. Right. And what does it really mean? Um, so I think some, ch you know, ch challenging repertoire creates opportunity to change lives. Um, I think opportunities to connect with other ensembles Mm -hmm. or other artists you know if i were to bring you in to play with our uh choir you know that creates an opportunity uh that they wouldn't have before mm -hmm. it will change their lives your set of experiences and your talents and knowledge and musicianship and artistry uh, all of that all you know alters the situation right um and improves and enhances the situation um Travel, of course, is the obvious one. You know, you bring your choir to Slovenia and right. you're going to have an experience unlike any other, yeah. um, you know, simply just by doing it. And it also forges relationships. You're traveling, uh, you're under stress and experiencing joy and all of the things that are associated with that. So that's exciting. And I also think that it creates memories and experiences that, I've had students leave and I'm sure you've experienced too, you know, you, you look, you look back at you and your, your experience in music sort of create this timeline for you. Right. And right. It, it's very strange. Like I don't always associate with other things in my life, but I can think like, Oh yeah, I remember that all state solo on oboe that I did. <laughs> and, you know, I remember in high school, you know, I was in marching band right. and I haven't done marching band since high school. Uh, so it, it's sort of the musical experience sort of compartmentalized my life. And then there's mm -hmm. things that lead to one thing, you know, another thing. And it's just really, 
it's kind of exciting and it's powerful, yeah. you know, because music has such a, a lasting impact. I think, you know, we all have those pieces or those experiences from childhood, you know, whether it's how'd you learn opera from the Bugs Bunny cartoons? Yeah. You know, I, I can name, if I never studied opera, I could recognize probably 30 themes <laughs> from the greatest pieces ever just from watching those cartoons. And that's, um, yeah. I mean, how powerful is that? Or how many times do you meet someone in the street who doesn't know Mozart, but hears something like, oh, that's from that commercial right. <laughs> for the cell phone or yeah. something. And you say, wow, okay. I mean, it, but that piece is so powerful that they're remembering it. Yeah. You know, without any other knowledge or any other stimuli. And I, and that gets me thinking a lot about, you know, the cog, again, going back to music cognition and the interest in how we learn music and that internalization, what you go to a sporting game and they do these chants. Mm -hmm. Well, it's communal and it's, as powerful as why we did Gregorian chant. Right. You know, I mean, yeah. uh, there's a thousand years between that thing, but it's the, it's the same purpose, you know, I mean, yeah. uh, or same c communal purpose. Right. And, you know, you're 80,000 people doing it. Yes. Or if you go to a rock concert, I always love when they'll, the band will stop and they'll let the audience sing. That's 80,000 people singing this melody together. I mean, you can hear it miles away. Yeah. And that's, I mean, there's no experience like that. You know, yeah. it, no matter what the what the piece is, you know, they could just as well be singing Don Giovanni. I mean, but to, could, right. could you imagine Don Giovanni sung by 85,000 people? Yeah, yeah, I mean, sure. That'd be fantastic. <laughs> yeah. um, but it's, it's part of who we are. It's hooked with our memories. I remember my earliest symphonic experience was hearing the Sibelius second symphony played by the Buffalo Philharmonic. I was a child and just those, those opening notes, um, will calm me at any point in my life. I can just close my eyes and just think of that, that opening that bum, 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 bum. And the, and the silence right before the next statement right. and just it's it's this just perfect uh calming effect and settles and can settle me down and carrying that through my whole life just uh, again i mean it affects my conducting how, mm -hmm. how do i approach gesture how do i how do i get uh, how, how do I affect sound through choosing repertoire or moving my hands or singing? How, where do we enjoy the silence? I mean, I'm rambling a bit, but it's just, it's all connected. It's just, I mean, the profound impact of music on our lives is, and, and how it affects us physically and internally is just this idea I keep circling back to. So that's why I really say it, you know, singing changes lives and, I mean, but it could be music changes lives, obviously. Right. But if every piece of every instrument was broken in the world, we, we could still have still the most sing. glorious yeah. music imaginable. Right. Yes. I mean, we did. Yes. <laughs> there, you know, I mean, we had, you know, thousands of years of music making before the, any, the organ or the piano was invented or right. the viol or, you know, and that's so cool. Yeah. And then what happens when we do add it? You yeah. Know, and then now we have choral orchestral music, or we have these massive Mahler symphonies. Mm -hmm. And and just as equally and intimately, we can have Chopin exists. Yeah. You know, good lord. I mean, what what is what is the height of musical expression through the piano? It might be that. Mm -hmm. yeah. You know, I mean, it's basically song. Right. Yes. And, Even though Ch Chopin didn't write you know, that, for. That's just all. It's, it's just really exciting. Voice. Yeah. Yeah. 
Okay. Well, um, I, I'm sorry. I can't hear you. I want to interact. I don't know what to do. I don't know if we should okay. reconnect or, it's, it's, I mean, I keep okay. trying different things. Thank you so I much. try audio one more time. Yeah. I, it's difficult it to seem to be doing anything. I, I apologize. It's I'm okay. sorry. <laughs> so Thank you so much for being with us uh, uh, today. And uh, I'm sorry I couldn't interject because uh, Brian wasn't uh, hear me. But uh, I, I, I hear hope, nothing. Uh, I hope <laughs> he had enjoyed talking to himself. Uh, but uh, he shared a lot of uh, um, really, really cool information about singing. And what I would add to that is that uh, um, I had a, a, a beautiful experience with a kid uh, who was four, started um, Musikalische Frühersziehung in Germany with me when he was four, and he couldn't speak, couldn't uh, say a word because uh, he was uh, his brain was damaged. So we started singing with them. I started singing two notes, three notes, four notes. Uh, and uh, after three years uh, of uh, music classes, this kid uh, started communicating and started kind of uh, expressing uh, um, thoughts with his voice and by just basically by singing. And singing had an enhanced a part of the brain that was not used before and it couldn't use the, you know, the part we use uh, for usually to speak. But uh, he used the singing part of the brain just to communicate with the word. So I thank uh, uh, Brian for being with us today and uh, I hope you uh, all enjoyed this video and uh, we will have an amazing video next week as well, uh, an amazing guest uh, and uh, I will see you all uh, in the next video. Bye! Thank you.